everyone. I'm Lisa Pritchard. Welcome to the library. Uh, restrooms are on the right. Uh, please silence your cell phones before we get started. Uh, today's presentation will be filmed by JCTV and available for viewing. Before I introduce our speaker in today's presentation, I'd like to welcome Elka Overton from the Jefferson College Diversity Committee. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, Jefferson College wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities of this region and to recognize that the college is situated on traditional Native American homelands, including those of the Shawnee, Delaware, and Osage people. We offer gratitude for the land itself, for those who have stewarded it for generations, and for the opportunity to study, learn, work, and be in community with this land. Um, I'll introduce today's speaker. Uh, Chris Otto is a professor of English at Jefferson College, and since he was a young boy, he says, he has been fascinated by Native Americans from 2013 to 2015. Um, he participated in a three-year National Endowment for the Humanities project titled Native Americans in the Midwest. This experience led him to conduct research on the Osage removal from Missouri and Native American legends surrounding the New Madrid earthquake. This talk, The Potawatomi Trail of Death, Memory and Legacy, was originally presented at the Missouri Folklore Society Conference in November of this year. As inheritors of a state and nation created by the choices of our ancestors, Professor Otto hopes this presentation will result in dialogue and reflection on the memory and legacy of Indian removal in Missouri. Please welcome Professor Otto. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to the Diversity Committee. Um, thank you to the library for hosting this, and thank you to all my students who showed up this afternoon. I'm sure that the extra credit was more appealing than you could, um, you know, you couldn't turn it down. So um, we're going to talk about the Potawatomi Trail of Death because if I asked you what group of Native Americans passed through Missouri in the 1830s, you would undoubtedly say the Cherokee on the um, Trail of Tears, which tends to uh, be well remembered in uh, textbooks and in our uh, collective uh, memory. And I am not a historian, but I am an English, I was an English major, so we study stories. And I have been thinking that if you look at historical events and arrange them in a particular order, you're creating a story. And we know as English majors, we have certain types of stories that are told for certain reasons. Um, we have tragedies, we have comedies, we have um, romantic, heroic, epic stories. And I think if we think about, or the way I've been thinking about Indian removal is it's a particular story, it's told in a particular way in order to uh, generate a particular response in the uh, listeners. So I was drawn to this because I didn't know that much about it. The, the Potawatomi Trail of Death cuts right across um, northern Missouri along Highway uh, 24. And um, that got me to thinking about these types of monuments, right? The, the Jefferson National ex uh, Westward Expansion. We have this huge monument to manifest destiny and westward expansion. And this monument implies a particular response on the part of the um, viewer, right? It tells a kind of a story. It tells kind of a heroic story. It tells a kind of story of uh, pioneer women out on the um, uh, trail, out, you know, mo moving west. And we kind of get the impression that there was nobody else out there and that this just was sort of um, inevitable, and that this is the way that um, things were supposed to turn out. I also like this painting. It's called American Progress. It's by Jonathan Gast, and this is American Progress. I don't know how well you can see it, but she's a woman, and she has the telegraph line, and she's sort of floating 
above the prairie. And then down here, we have some disgruntled Indians. And I, my favorite part of it is this bear. You can barely see right here, but the bear's looking back and it's making a negative, you know, it's giving this a dirty look. And then here we have, right, yeoman farmers, and we have uh, democracy and technology coming from the East, and we're civilizing um, the West. That's a particular story. To create the context for the, today's discussion, I want you to think about um, what is Missouri now. And if you look at the period from around 1836 to about 1839, there's a lot happening. The first thing that has to happen is all the once mighty and powerful Osage, they have to be removed. And they're out of the state of Missouri by 1837. Completely gone, out. 1836 is an interesting year in Missouri history because when Missouri became a state, the western border was a straight line. And this little piece, this, ad, this additional uh, piece of land was actually promised to Sac and Fox Indians as well as uh, Potawatomi. But when white people, uh, white settlers came in this area, they said, hey, this looks really good. And we were able to, through our two senators, Lynn and Thomas Hart Benton, they were able to renegotiate an 1833 tribe uh, treaty that promised that land to Native Americans. We incorporated it into the state, and then those Indians had to be removed to Iowa or uh, another place into uh, Kansas. Also, in the winter of 1838 to 1839, we have this huge migration of over like 14,000 Cherokee who are coming through the southern part of the state. The last bit is in 1838, there were Mormons in this region here as well, the governor of the state of Missouri, Boggs, issued an extermination order and essentially said, you have to leave or we're killing you. And so I thought about that, and I just thought, well, Missouri is really the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a site of a lot of historical trauma, and this little window in time between like 1836 and 1838, you've got Indians coming through, you've got Mormons being pushed out, you've got um, white settlers flooding into the area, and I just think it's also on top of that, I'm not going to get into this, but 1838, there was a huge financial panic. Uh, the Panic of 1838. So there's a lot of things that are happening uh, regionally in this uh, particular moment in time. So let's talk about the uh, Potawatomi and how they factor into this uh, particular story. So you can see the traditional homeland is right around uh, the Great Lakes region of Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, and uh, parts of um, Wisconsin. And um, they were once part of a, a unified tribe with the Ojibwe and the Adawa, and they lived in northern uh, Michigan. And as they moved, they were being pressured by these Iroquois people during the Beaver Wars. They move into this region that we're in now, and they're known as the keepers of the sacred fire. The Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and the, Atawa, or the uh, Adawa languages are very, very similar. They refer to themselves uh, the Potawatomi people do as the Nishinabek, which means the true people. And if you look at most Indian names and you translate it, it almost always says something like the original people. We're the people. Around, I'm, I'm going to skip through some of the discussion of the treaties because that can be a little bit um, tedious, but there was an, an English artist named George Winter who really wanted to come to America to paint Native Americans, and he went to Logansport, Indiana. And this is, this, this is the location where this last holdout band of Potawatomi was, um, had gathered, and they had you know, formed uh, villages. And so he, pick, he was able to depict, the, he painted this uh, painting uh, that depicts a, uh, a burial, and these are all the Potawatomi uh, women. He painted this uh, man right here, and um, he even notes in his journals that he was a little bit disappointed that these Indians didn't look the way that he had anticipated that they would look. And as you can tell, 
or maybe you can tell from the uh, imagery here, he's wearing like Western style cloth. He's got this turban. If you look at some of his other artwork, I'll talk about Francis Slocum here in just a minute, but the Potawatomi, and just like many Native American tribes, were very uh, successful at adapting to and adopting Western technology, whether it, or, or clothing, or uh, even religion in this case. Many of them converted to Catholicism. Um, so these images, okay, the Francis Slocum, this woman right here that he painted, she had actually been kidnapped as a child somewhere in uh, Pennsylvania by some Delaware Indians. And then through trading and swapping, she ended up with the Potawatomi in Indiana. And um, George Winter finds her and he asks her and her three daughters to sit for a portrait. Now you'll notice one of the daughters, the one on the left, is facing the opposite direction. This was, um, she thought that it was like a bad luck to have your image to be painted. So she didn't want to have her face captured. So she's looking the other um, direction. But what's interesting is, is that when all the rest of the um, Potawatomi are removed from Indiana, she gets to stay in Indiana because she could claim um, white Euro, you know, European American ancestry. And then the descendants of Francis Slocum, they become the core of this little tiny um, group of Potawatomi that remained um, in Indiana. So, uh, well, I'm pressing the button the wrong here. So the Potawatomi Trail of Death, just like every other Native American removal story, is much more complicated. They come in different waves. The one that we're going to talk about is this one that cuts across right here. But you can see be between, you know, the uh, 18, really in the 1830s, after the passage of the Indian Removal Act, all of this stuff really gets amped up. The Potawatomi acts actually splinter into three or four bigger groups or smaller groups. One group kind of heads actually into Canada. The Pokegan group stays around Chicago. The, um, the band that we're going to talk about today, which is known as the Citizen Potawatomi, they make this journey here. But you can see 1833 and 1834, this land, the Platte Purchase, was promised to Potawatomi. And then when it came 1836, they had to move either into Iowa or they moved further down into um, Kansas. So every tribe has its removal story. It's not just the Trail of Tears. It's not just the Osage. Every tribe has it. And we're going to talk about this uh, particular story. So I thought this was an interesting series of maps. You can see from 1817, all of this was still considered Indian land. And then as you can see, it keeps getting smaller and more subdivided until 1856, the entire, um, you know, the state of Indiana has been completely reclaimed. And so the treaty process was just the, the next best approach to try to get land. Um, they tried civilization. Hey, let's teach them how to farm. Let's teach them to become uh, Christians. Let's try to get them to do uh, private property. And in many ways, the Cherokee did all of those things, and so did the Potawatomi as well. And so with the, with the Indian Removal Act, now the federal government can um, negotiate directly. So we have Chief Menominee, and in 1909, this statue was, of him was built in Plymouth, Indiana. And I told you earlier, this is where the last holdout band had sort of set up their villages. And this is a, a quote that's attributed to him from a newspaper in 1838. And essentially he says, hey, look, we've signed all these treaties. And actually, I didn't sign that many of them, but he maintains that his X, because he couldn't write, was forged on um, the treaties. And I looked at many of the treaties, and his name appears on several treaties going back into the early uh, 1830s, actually all the way back to 1826. He says, no, I never signed this. He then indicts the people uh, who did the treaty negotiation by um, using alcohol and then pretending to get my consent. He says, I'm not leaving. 
He says, um, you know, I, the great spirit has allowed me to have this land and you can't tell me to leave. I will not be tied like a dog. I've not sold my lands. I will not sell them. I've not signed any treaty. I'm not going anywhere. And so this, the people in Indiana want this place. They want this land. And so the governor of Indiana, whose name is David Wallace, and I can't not think about the, the guy on the office every time, you know, David Wallace from the, anyway. He was the, um, he was the governor. He calls out a uh, general tipped in and says, you can um, round up a militia of 100 volunteers from the area, and we're going to forcibly uh, remove these people. And so George Winter comments on this in his um, journal, and he says it was only by deceptive, in, my moral point, in a moral point of view, and cunning, cruel plan, they were coerced to immigrate. And I think these words are really interesting, removal and immigrate and relocate. Um, and I really think that a more appropriate word would be ethnic cleansing. It seems like it aligns very clearly with UN um, language on ethnic cleansing. So what they did was they, con they convened a council of the chiefs at the Catholic mission in Twin Lakes. And the, the, um, the priest at that Catholic mission, his name was Father Pettit. He was from France. He grew very, very close to the Potawatomi, as lots of French people did. The French intermingled and intermarried with Native Americans, Osage people, Potawatomi people. And so many of the um, Native Americans formed a strong bond with the uh, French. So they said, hey, we're going to have a meeting at this um, near Plymouth and we're going to have a council and when they all showed up they didn't realize that it was a trap and the sold the militiamen showed up with their guns they immediately arrested Menominee and they put him essentially they describe it as a jail wagon he makes most of the journey in a little wagon and I'm imagining with little bars and then there are uh, soldiers on horseback with uh, fixed bayonets and rifles, and they're forcing the, um, the people on this long walk. Um, I'm going to, well, this is a description of what the entire procession looked like, and this is a sketch that he did um, in his notebook. But this is from the artist George Winter, and he says, soon the whole nation were seen moving down the hillsides along the banks of the Eel River on the way uh, to their westward home. The, the whole, the entire trail was 661 miles and they did it in 60 days. And now there were, that's about 10, oh, about 11 miles a day, but there were several days when they, um, when they got to about Danville, Illinois, the priest convinced the conductors to let them have Sundays off so that they could have mass and they could bury um, the dead as well. <clears throat> so um, 850 roughly Potawatomi begin the 660 mile forced march from Indiana to Osawatomi, um, Kansas. They begin in September, and they, they arrive in Kansas in November. And about 40, depending on what sources you say, anywhere between 41 and 47 people died. Most of them were children because of dehydration or diarrhea, and then they were sort of left, you know, buried in kind of unmarked um, graves as they went. The Catholic priest who accompanied them he describes this, and I'm just going to focus on this. Um, he says, the U.S. flag carried by a dragoon, and then we have um, 250 to 300 horses. Um, then they have uh, 40 baggage wagons filled with all their belongings. The sick were lying in the baggage wagons, and it was very, very hot in Illinois. And so the worst part of the trip, uh, the whole trip was terrible, but the worst part of it um, is actually in um, Illinois. Oh, by the way, the word Chicago is a Potawatomi word, 
And it translates, you know, if you don't like Chicago, it's a, it translates as either to the smell of a skunk or the smell of onions. And uh, there's, some, there's some question about that. So this is what the whole um, trail uh, looked like. And this is the ending up point in Osawatomie, uh, Kansas. Of course, this wasn't the final spot. They, they then further removed into Oklahoma. And we're going to focus on what happened uh, here in Missouri. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the events as they unfolded in Illinois. So I know this is a lot of text. And I'm, I know you're not supposed to have too much information on your slides. I know that. But these are like quotes right out of Father um, uh, Pettit's uh, diary. Uh, that, or actually, these are um, quotes out of William Polk's official diary that he kept for the US Army. And so what they usually say in Illinois is, it was hot, it was dusty, the horses are jaded. I thought that was kind of an interesting turn of phrase. Have you ever seen a jaded horse? I don't know. And that the Indians are sickly because there was no water, and the water that they had was tainted, and so there were outbreaks of waterborne um, illnesses. The second day, oh, and then he usually ends it with what they ate, where they camped, and how many people died that day. Um, I added this, when Father Pettit arrives, he, he talked them out of keeping the chiefs in the jail wagon, and, and then he baptized any of the babies that uh, happened to be dying. So then the next day, they only went six miles, and this is because so many of them were actually sick. About three, according to the diaries three, and the journals, 300 of the 800 were, were like incapacitated with illness um, early on. So then Tuesday the 18th, don't worry, I'm not going to go through every single day because that would take forever, but Tuesday they stayed in the camp and um, they had to discharge some of the troops. A man and a woman died, a woman was born, and then they call upon this doctor, uh, Jeroleman, and another doctor, Dr. Buell of Williamsport, and they try to um, heal and, and, and you know, provide health care for the sick Native Americans. But one of the things that they did was they would bleed the uh, people, which made it even obviously worse. Um, and then they themselves, the doctors themselves, got sick. So then the Indians really said, hey, look, keep your doctors away. They're bleeding us, and they are sick. If they were real doctors, they wouldn't be sick. And so um, there comes a point during the journey where they ask if the doctors could please go away and leave them alone. Their uh, rations, um, none of these uh, passages include the rations, but they usually end with the rations, and it says beef and flour. And I did some more reading, and I, I found out that what they would take the flour and like fry it up in the grease from the meat, and they'd make like a kind of bread or like a biscuit type of thing. Or they would boil it and make like a dumpling. But it's interesting to note that in the journal kept by Polk, he says that none of the militiamen would eat the food. And so they forced the um, general um, Tipton uh, to give them money so they could go into town and buy their own food. And once they get a little bit further into the journey, the Indians finally convince their captors that, hey, just let us hunt, because there's deer all over the place, and we could eat that. Plus, most of them didn't have shoes on, so they could use the deer hide to make uh, moccasins. So um, that becomes part of the story when they get to Missouri, where it gets much, um, uh, much colder. Another thing that shows, so this is, um, this is one of the many monuments. In 1996, the trail was recognized as a national regional trail. And so because of that, the state governments of Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and Kansas went out and placed uh, monuments across um, where the campsites um, occurred. And what I can't help noticing again and again and again. What does that look like? If you think about the arch as this great monument to westward expansion, that's a headstone. Which, what is the story that the headstone tells you? It says these people are gone. 
right? So that tells me that this is a type of tragedy, but the tragedy is, is that they're just gone. They just don't exist anymore, right? And then you look around and you know, yeah, that seems to be true, but that's not the case. Um, there are Potawatomi uh, still around and there's over 30,000 active members on the uh, roll. I put this one on here because when they came through Jacksonville, Illinois, and a couple of other places, they were paraded through the street, downtown Main Street, and a, a brass band showed up and played music, and townspeople came out and gave them um, tobacco. And so I always wonder, what would that, what would that have looked like, and what, would that, uh, what, would, what did the um, Potawatomi think about you know, what was happening as they were sort of um, on display in a certain sense. So this is all of the different um, spots um, in Missouri from West Quincy to Palmyra all the way over here to, um, you know, here's Independence, <clears throat> Lexington. I'm just going to hit a few of the uh, highlights so that you can kind of have a better understanding of the um, uh, story here. So this is near Palmyra. They went about 13 uh, miles, and um, the most interesting thing here, I mean, he always, it's very cold and very, you know, unemotional. A woman died shortly after the transportation, after uh, the encampment today. An ox wagon was engaged in the transportation of Indians, having lost its cattle, was forced to remain behind with its load. The wagon, along with those left to hunt the oxen, will be up tomorrow. Um, not much happened, but he does point out, once they get to Missouri, he keeps saying that the health and the spirits, the spirits of the Indians, they're a lot, they're a lot happier now um, because it rains and there's more water because they're at all these different uh, rivers. And again, I realize that we don't get any firsthand accounts from the Indians, but it's interesting to see what um, he thought was interesting. And this is sort of the official seal that accompanies most of the uh, monuments. And a very typical monument in Missouri and in Kansas would be something like this affixed to a stone um, or a rock. By the way, I went and took pictures of all of these, and this is in the behind a Hardee's. And I was like, well, I mean, I get it. They wanted to be, you know, accurate on the location, but context is important, right? So um, he's always talking about how the Indians are getting into trouble with uh, liquor and alcohol. Um, in fact, um, there's some indication that General Morgan, one of the other uh, soldiers who was sort of in charge of moving, he also had some issues with alcohol and he is um, excused at some point. I'll um, tell you right here about that. But this again is another very common uh, monument. And again, if we're structuring narrative events into a type of a story, this is a kind of story. Not only is it a tombstone, but it even has the decorative, you know, flowers as though we were paying homage to something that happened. It's over, and now we can kind of just move on, you know, with our lives. But Morgan, from what I've read, this guy apparently was getting whiskey or alcohol and then selling it to the Indians, or he may have taken alcohol and given it to a woman and then tried to make advances on her. Either way, around this time, Morgan voluntarily offers his resignation, and then he's out of the uh, picture. But Polk never talks about it. The information about Morgan and his drinking and his carousing uh, with women is, you find that in other sources, but it, it doesn't show up here. Um, and and um, this is, the, when they get to uh, Paris, this is where they ask, hey, if this Dr. J, if they could not, if he, if he could just leave and not be part of the group anymore, the Indians would be very happy because he didn't like them bleeding them and they didn't like also having um, um, the fact that he was sick. What kind of a doctor, you know, is sick when he comes to try to uh, take care of you? So um, it's a little bit of drama along the trail as well and again, that is a tombstone. That is an interesting choice for a monument to some kind of historical um, event. 
Once they get near Moberly, which, and I thought this was really interesting, it's only October 16th, it starts to snow. Can anybody remember having snow in October in Missouri in your lifetime? And then I started thinking, wow, that's really interesting. You know, at 200 years, you know, that's climate change has changed that much where we would never have. Even the coldest I ever remember was like one Halloween when I was like 11 and there were flurries, I think. It was like 1980 or anyway. The day was very, very cold. Again, many of the um, forced um, immigrants have no shoes, and so they need to make moccasins. They need to um, try to have, I can't even imagine what they uh, slept in um, at night. Um, again, we have drunken Indians. Um, we do have the uh, snow turned over to rain, and then what they gave them straw at night to, um, I guess, to use this kind of like bedding. And um, that's a fairly bleak way to spend a night. And then it, going from Huntsville to around Sheraton, they have to cross the Sheraton River. And the weather is cold. It's not hot like it was in Illinois. There seems to be plenty of water. Um, the other thing you notice about these monuments is that most of the time, they're Eagle Scout pro uh, projects. And I thought that was really interesting too because the Boy Scouts have a strange relationship with Native Americans in that they've sort of borrowed a lot of uh, Native American iconography. So if you were, were you in Boy Scouts, Charles? Yeah, so if you were in Boy Scouts and you did the Order of the Arrow, that whole ritual is sort of a ripoff of a kind of quasi Native American thing, which is, I don't know if that's in the best, um, if that's the best thing that we can do there. Um, so that's the one in, um, uh, now we're on to um, Keatsville. Something interesting starts happening in, in around Keatsville. And that is they start to hear rumblings of the uh, Mormons and the non-Mormons um, engaged in this kind of low-level uh, war, essentially. So uh, the Mormons, as you know, Joseph Smith thought that that northwest part of Missouri was going to be the second Garden of Eden and that the Messiah would come back to Independence, Missouri. So these places were really important for their religion. And when I first heard about the Mormon war, I thought, well, they probably, people didn't like them because they were polygamists, right? But that really wasn't the case. They didn't like them because the uh, Mormons thought that the Indians were one of the lost tribes of Israel. So they were very warm and welcoming to Native Americans and very friendly um, to them. Plus, they also tended to really stick um, to themselves and not really you know, integrate into the larger uh, communities. So they were kind of seen as outsiders. They were kind of seen as people whose you know, lifestyle and intention were very different. And then you have this kind of tit for tat thing going back and forth. Some people burn down a Mormon barn and then some Mormons go and burn down some of their stuff. And the next thing you know, you have this low level kind of guerrilla war um, taking place. So as they get closer and closer to kind of Northwest Missouri, as they're moving along, these Mormons and these, uh, the, the people who are fighting them see this big, right, train of like a thousand people coming across northern Missouri and they think, are you on our side or are you on the Mormon side or, you know, what's, you know, kind of what's uh, um, kind of going on here? Um, this is the one in Brunswick and again, this is a Cub Scout um, uh, a pack. Here's another uh, tombstone. So again, um, the country through which we pass is very much um, excited. Nothing is heard, nothing is talked of, but the Mormons and the difficulties between them and the citizens of Upper Missouri. Well, in um, the winter, uh, like I guess it's like November of 1838, Boggs issues that order and they're forced out. They go to Quincy, Illinois, and then go to Nauvoo, El uh, Nauvoo Illinois. And then after that, they f later they go out to, the Mormons go to Salt Lake City. But if you think about Mormon removal, Cherokee, Potawatomi, Osage removal, it's hard to think of that in this heroic sense. It sounds like ethnic cleansing. It sounds like the creation of 
a white ethno, a Protestant kind of ethno state. Um, again, more Mormon troubles here, right? Um, the conductor was waited upon by a gentleman who it appeared had been delegated by the citizen of Richmond, a village near us, to request assistance as they anticipated an attack from the Mormons. So some of the townspeople said, hey, would you mind helping us fight off these Mormons that are coming to attack us? And of course they didn't realize, no, we've got these guys, we're escorting them to Kansas, so we can't help you, you know, fight the uh, Mormons. Um, Lexington, Missouri, this is my favorite one. Um, here in Lexington, you have, this is a famous, uh, the Madonna of the Trail, because many of these trails out to, to the west started in northwest Missouri, like the, the Mormon Trail, for example. Um, so this is a, mo a, a monument, and this is a, you can't see it that well, uh, I need to take a photography class, but she's holding an infant in one arm, she has a rifle in the other, there's a rattlesnake down by her foot, and I mean this tells a story of a powerful pioneer woman who's not only can she kill rattlesnakes and take care of the baby, but she is blazing a path out to the west. So that is right here, and then in front of this, down here, it has this little elevated kind of garden uh, platform, and then kind of down here is the uh, Trail of Death marker. And I think that's kind of an interesting placement, you know, from like just like a geographic standpoint. This is like contested um, territory. Again, it's mounted to a stone. It just tells how many people camped here. It does say their forced removal from Indiana. They, they uh, uh, camped on the bank of the Missouri River opposite Lexington, uh, October 27th. And then again, it was a Boy Scout uh, troop. And um, I don't know, I'm just kind of interested um, in that. What's the story? What's the appropriate response? What's the, um, what are we supposed to think of that? Um, and so then they cross um, over the river at that point, and they get to, um, they've got a ferry, you know, back and forth. Still great excitement is prevailing. Reports are rife throughout the country of bloodshed, house burning, etc. The people seem completely crazed. By sunset, all the wagons, save a few, are on the opposite bank of the river. Early in the morning, we shall proceed to cross with the river, uh, to, to cross uh, the Indians. So all this excitement about the uh, Mormons uh, being um, expelled and removed and um, an expulsion, um, an, ex an execution order is given. This is the only image I could find of Father um, Pettit who accompanied the Indians. He became extremely ill on the trip across. His journals describe his body, he describes his body is covered in open sores. He has fever. He can't really continue with the group. And so oftentimes um, a prominent member or just a friendly person, a French person often, or a Catholic would say, hey, why don't you stay in my house and get better? And then after a couple days, you can catch up with the, um, with the larger group. And so by the time he makes it to, um, St. Mary's Mission in Kansas, which is where they ev eventually end up, he's nearly dead. <clears throat> um, and after they, stab they get to their uh, location, they're supposed to have houses and all this stuff. Nothing's ready. It's winter. It's terrible. But I thought I would put a little quote from him, and, and this kind of reveals how committed he really was. He says, this young Christendom in the midst of the anguish of exile and the ravages of epidemic has received all the aid of religion. The sick have been anointed. The soil which covers the ashes of the dead is consecrated. Faith and the practice of religious duties have been maintained even in their temporal sorrows. He whom these poor people call their father has had the consolation of often being able to render assistance. And now left in the able hands of the Jesuit fathers, they need not regret the violent blow which has torn them from us, from the country, as they say, where their fathers rest. So he leaves them there. He starts to head back. Actually, he takes a couple months to try to recuperate. It's not until February that he um, gets on a horse and starts to head back. He's going to go back to St. Louis because there's a Jesuit 
community there, and then maybe he'll go to some other um, Indian mission. By the time he gets to um, Jefferson City, he's, his, his body is so um, damaged and so, he's in so much pain, he, he buys a bear uh, skin and he thinks if he puts that on his horse it'll be more comfortable for him to ride. When he gets to St. Louis, he ultimately dies and he was only 29 years old. He's buried in St. Louis. If I had, I can find, a, I should have put a picture of his tombstone on here as well, but I'm sorry, um, I actually I didn't. So the Potawatomi are not dead and gone. They're, they don't need a tombstone. They have um, land in Oklahoma, northeastern Kansas. There are bands in northern Michigan. There's some in Canada, and there are a few in other parts of uh, Michigan um, as well. There are over 30,000 uh, members on the uh, roll. These are different bands, but they all sort of collectively refer to as uh, the Potawatomi. So there's the Prairie Band, Citizen Potawatomi, there's Pokegan's Band, um, who stayed around in um, Chicago. Part of the reason why Pokegan's Band was allowed to stay was because he became Catholic. And so that was, okay, that's good enough. You can, you can do that. This uh, map is from um, Land Heritage, I think. It's a Canadian group, and it's like a digital map. So it doesn't really show up very well in the light here, but you can see the overlapping um, regions where different tribes lived pre-contact. And so by some estimates, if you, you know, include all of Canada and um, Central and South America, there were tens of millions of Native Americans who lived here and had, you know, obviously run of the place. And then this is, the, this is from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and this shows the current uh, land holdings from, um, that Native Americans currently um, own. And as you can see, there is nothing in Missouri, right? It's completely been um, sanitized, as it were. So we're kind of getting near uh, to the end of my talk, and then I hope that you'll have some questions or we can have some discussion. And so uh, I tried to think about, well, what is the re what's the appropriate um, kind of response. And so I found in the Eastern Mennonite University Center for Justice and Peace Building, um, they have a transforming historical harms and they make these four uh, points. And so I think the first step is like facing the history. And by that, they, now, they don't just say, we'll just learn about it, but they also suggest you have to acknowledge the causal links between the events and the current state of affairs. You can't do anything until you go uh, past that. Um, then making connections. And I think land acknowledgement statements are great, but we need to take the next step, which is make connections. How can, you know, there's this whole land back movement with the Osage people. I don't know if anybody f is paying attention, but they um, tried to build a casino by the Lake of the Ozarks just down from the dam and some wealthier people bought the land and then they did a housing um, development there. But what could Jefferson College do? What could we do in terms of making connections to uh, Osage people in terms of you know, trying to transform historical uh, harms? Uh, healing wounds, again, making connections, making space available, and then ultimately um, you know, taking action. So, that's kind of the story. Um, I, I have one, I'll ask you a question. When your great-great-grandparents steal something and they pass it down to you, when does it belong to you? When does it become yours? Charles? Never. All right, that's one answer. But... Um, so thank you very much for uh, coming out today. I hope that you have questions or, con or uh, comments or we can, did you have something to say? Carl? Him? I don't know him. All right. Well, thank you uh, for being here and um, I hope that you learned a little bit about this chapter in Missouri history 
in terms of Mormons, Osage, Potawatomi, and how we, um, you know, I think that in the introduction, we inherited the world that was created by the people who came before us. And it's our decision to um, arrive at a reasonable uh, reaction, a response. What do we do with it? A lot of people say, well, my ancestors didn't have anything to do with it. But yeah, but we, we all benefit from, uh, we benefit from the things that they did. And what obligation do we have? And I don't, I don't have the answer to that, but I just wanted to tell you the story. So thank you for uh, being here. And we could have questions or comments well, if anybody I'm has them. when you mention that, because we own farmland in Iowa. OK. My dad grew up on farm in Iowa, and his great-grandfather would have been the one that originally acquired that land somehow. Yeah. So I don't know. You know, what's the historic documentation of how he acquired that land? I mean, the whole acquisition of land was like uh, a sort of economic en engine, right? So when people knew, you know, they knew that the, um, this land here in the, what became the uh, Platt Purchase, they knew that, white people knew that this was going to be eventually absorbed into the state of Missouri. So they start hanging out right on the edge there. They want to get there first. And then through the treaty negotiation, you know, um, I can't, sometimes they bought the land for like 20 cents an acre, right? The government would pay them, oh yeah, we'll give you $50,000 or whatever for this huge, vast tract of land, which then they would turn around and sell to people at this really, really high uh, rate. And so, I, don't, I mean, that would be interesting to, you know, uh, research, but I mean, the big, the broader issue is, is that anywhere that you're standing or any land that you're on was originally Native American land. So we, you know, Ken Burns had the documentary, The Greatest Idea of America Are National Parks. Okay, that's true. It was all stolen, right? It was all stolen. And, 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 then, and we took all the people who once lived there and, and, and forced them out of there. So I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm not trying to um, impress anything upon you in terms of that, but I think that like, knowledge is sort of like the first step. And then, you know, um, what you do with it from there is, is probably up to you. Um, yeah, come on. Is there any fact to, I don't know, uh, but like as far as many of the different tribes in there and their religious practices, right? Like I always understood that that was part of what made it easier for people to take their land was because they kind of had a religious perspective that you can't actually own land. Yeah, I mean, you can read all kinds of stuff about the treaty, you know, negotiations and how they were, uh, they didn't know what they were signing or they were misled or they thought that but they it could... Just felt like this, we, the land isn't theirs. You know, yeah. We live on this land. We're able to use this land from a religious perspective. Like, that's how, that's how I understood that they saw it. Yeah, so I think when, that's you know, true. Like people came in and started saying, well, I'm going to own that land. They were like, what are you talking about? We can't own the land, right? Like, yeah. Like, yeah, that's true. That, that definitely comes through in the record. And then you have like, there'll be these little factions. And if one guy over here was mad at this guy over here, he'd be like, yeah, I'll sign that uh, treaty because it's going to screw him out of something. And I might be able to, you know, leverage that for better uh, treatment by the people who, you know, are coming in this uh, particular area. So, yeah, this was, uh, you know, my discussion was to try to honor Native American uh, Heritage Month. And anybody else have any questions or comments? Sam? Uh, yes? Charles. Sorry, I just looked at Sam. Do you know the Potawatomi people when they became Catholic or they were forced? These guys, um, so there were a Baptist, there's a Baptist missionary, and he set up in like Kentucky. And Menominee, him, this was part of their attempt to try to assimilate. They thought it would be a good idea if they had um, a Catholic mission near their um, land. So they invited um, this, there was a priest before Pettit, and there, the diocese was sort of centered in Vincennes, Indiana. But Menominee thought, hey, if we have, we're going to have to, he, he, they, re, they weren't stupid. They knew they were going to have to either figure out how to live with white people 
or fight them, which, you know, after like the Battle of Fallen Timbers and the Treaty of Greenville, 1795, that pretty much ends the fighting in that region, the old Northwest Ohio in that area. So this was a choice that they made. That's a great question, Charles. That he thought that if we had them here, we adopted the Catholic practices. And of course they would kind of synthesize their religion with Catholicism, but we could learn English. This would be a goodwill gesture towards the people that we'll have to uh, live with. And so that was a conscious, um, you know, a choice. And if, in Pettit's um, letters, he is constantly writing about how devout and how committed and how spiritually, you know, um, disciplined and dedicated to Catholicism that the Potawatomi um, were. So this is an, an, an example of where this was a choice, this was an attempt to try to assimilate um, uh, with white people. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, coming. I hope that you got something out of it today. Thank you. Thank you.